and we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Guy Featherston Hall, and it's my enormous pleasure to um, introduce the participants in our first virtual social context of the law webinar, the subject being, does the bar need to communicate and market itself more in the modern world? Uh, the social context of the law series of symposia were originally devised by the late master John Laws, uh, Master Nice, who I'm delighted to see here this evening, Master Sheeman, ditto, and the late Master Scruton. This is the first um, symposium in this series since the death of Sir John Laws only a few months ago, which was a matter which was a huge sadness to this inn, given that he'd been a past treasurer and had played a, a pivotal role in its running. So it, it's um, especially it's significant to us that we mark his death with, with this symposium. Now, the, the purpose of the social context of the law program as a whole, uh, which is open not merely to members of the inns, but also to the general public, is to enhance an understanding of the law and its social importance through open discussion of difficult questions that the law is asked to address and concerning which there may be equally plausible but conflicting views. Um, so it takes the, takes the form of a discussion between expert speakers with questions being posed by a moderator. And this evening as moderator, we have Master Miles Young, uh, a bencher of the Inner Temple, um, and the Warden of New College. Now, Miles obtained first class honours in history at New College and went on to have a brilliant career in business, ending up as chairman and CEO of Ogilvy and Mather. It, it is said by those in the know that he was being groomed as a successor to Sir Martin Sorrell at WPP, but he preferred to enter public life in his current role as warden of New College Oxford. And then our two speakers are John Shaw, uh, John is the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Super Union, and John had a career across various brands and communication in agencies such as Weed and, and Kennedy, Y&R, and Ogilvy and Mather, where he became Joint Head of Planning globally. Over the years, John has worked with many leading global brands, Microsoft, Nike, Coca-Cola, Disney, Amazon, Huawei, Vodafone, Shangri-La and British Airways. So a wealth of experience to bring to the topic this evening. And then our second speaker, Master Helen Davies. Helen is joint head of Brick Court Chambers, um, succeeding, although not immediately, um, Sir John Laws himself. Um, Helen has, her website says, extensive experience in all aspects of various it's litigation. We all tend to say that on our websites, but with Helen, it seems that she's been in every single tribunal, tribunal at the highest possible levels in this country and abroad, including the Court of Justice of the European Union. I think the only tribunal she hasn't been in is the Leasehold Valuation First Tier Tribunal. Um, she's featured in the Lawyers Hot 100 and in 2019, she won Commercial Litigation Silk of the Year in the Legal 500 UK Bar Awards. Um, she is also a Master of the Bench of the Inner Temple. Um, she's a good friend. She's a trustee of the Council of the Inns of Court and none better than she to represent, as it were, the profession in um, tonight's discussion. We're particularly grateful to Miles, John and Helen for speaking virtually to us without the usual carrot of a nice dinner to follow and a nice drink beforehand. Uh, I'm also very glad to welcome so many of you, members of the public, uh, members of the inn and others, including very many students. It's good to see you here on the hottest evening of the year. Uh, enough from me, I'll hand over now, please, to Miles. Well, thank you very much, uh, Master Treasurer, and a good evening from New College, where I'm 
essentially the only man left standing um, and with six students and the dean and the chaplain in a college which is completely um, otherwise deserted. I'm so uh, happy to be chairing this panel uh, and, and I would just add my own gloss a little bit to, to your remarks about the, the, the panelists. Um, John's role in, in, in Super Union really combines strategy and creativity. So I think he will provide a very interesting uh, perspective um, on our discussions. Um, he's worked on many famous brands and Super Union, I think uh, you could drink your way through Super Union at the moment. You could start with Bacardi, you go on to Nespresso and you could end up the next morning with Jägermeister. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have a jolly good night out. Uh, and uh, Helen um, uh, uh, seems also particularly appropriate to this to this uh, um, session because she has um, an expertise in outreach. Um, she serves on the in strategic advisory group, and what we're talking about really is an aspect of strategy. So our title um, within this social context of the law series is: Does the bar need to communicate and market itself more in the modern world? I suppose then the, the premise for tonight is that the perceptions and imagery of the bar, and indeed maybe the law, uh, are things which do define its social context. And in the past, uh, I have heard it described as an old fashioned um, view, but a commonly held one, that the bar just doesn't need to advertise itself. It's probably not fair to label it as old fashioned because I don't think that view would be expressed so much these days after 20 years of a, of a digital revolution which has created an entirely different um, context both um, social and cultural and economic but i i suspect that that digital revolution would allow us to reframe a little bit at that old old question should we promote ourselves or not of course the bar council does now encourage it and it says chambers can direct advertising towards both lay and professional clients. Stipulation only being to make clear that barristers um, are only able to provide legal services following instructions from, from professional clients. So the question is perhaps not so much whether, but um, as is indicated, how much um, and indeed can one learn something from other fields or is law somehow and are part of the law um, a field completely apart. I've already used a number of words with slightly different meanings um, in relation to this topic. And when I worked in advertising, we were actually never able to describe precisely what we did. It was always a difficult thing when you have to fill in a, a visa form, put in occupation, and you put okay. in advertising. Is it really? That's is that what I do? Um, and we also never knew whether we were a profession or a trade. Um, but Advertising does have two things in common with the law. Um, first of all, it is stigmatized in popular culture. So for Rumpel, um, read Dan Draper. It's uh, two sides of the same coin, and we both have to uh, escape from those stereotypes. But secondly, they both actually have at their core uh, the principle of advocacy, um, whether it be advocacy in pursuit of commercial objectives or, or advocacy in, in pursuit of, of uh, justice. So marshalling evidence and the presentation of a distinctive and coherent argument um, in process terms, they're actually quite, quite similar. But it will probably make sense to pin those terms down a little bit more. I take communication um, to mean transmitting information from A to B by any channel. Um, I take it that advertising is a form of communication usually paid for, which involves some form of public display. Um, and marketing, um, is something not, not, not mentioned so much, but is another um, definition that has to be made clear. And that is all embracing um, of many other disciplines, but it has a strong sense of promoting and selling. And direct marketing is private one-to-one -one marketing. So my first question is to John. And John, uh, the question is all these interconnected disciplines, or rather obfuscatory, perhaps, in their titles. Um, but what is their fundamental role? Um, how would you describe their purpose? Yeah, well, um, yeah, let me, let me go through them, um, sort of several terms, one by one, because, um, as you say, there, there, there always does seem to be quite a lot of terminology um, about this. But if I start with marketing, um, I think 
one of the interesting things about that, I mean, if you if you take a sort of technical definition, it might be something like identifying and satisfying customer needs and wants more effectively than competitors. Um, and what I think is interesting about that is that it's, it sort of starts with customer needs. So although it has that aspect of promotion, um, it's not just about pumping stuff out. Um, it's about, it's about identifying what people, what people need or, or what they, what they might want, even if they haven't expressed it. Um, and then finding a way to satisfy that. And obviously given that there's always competition, you know, even outside of business, there's always, there's always competition. Um, it's trying to do that better than other people. So in a way it's a system for, you know, to try and sort of promote an efficient satisfaction of customer needs. Um, and of course, in the case of the law, it raises the question, well, who, who is the competition? Um, because for individual lawyers and firms, it may be other firms, but then there's also the question of sort of what does the, what does the profession compete with um, overall? But I think I would say that the system, the marketing system wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be there if it wasn't to some extent an efficient way of, of getting people what they want. Um, and then the, the one that leads on to that next is, um, and probably the most emotive term that I might use is brand. Um, because I think a lot of people in professions and various walks of life don't, don't really like to think of themselves as brands or what they do as being in any way related to brands. Um, and they possibly think of brands as being, you know, very much a sort of um, just a means of sort of um, pushing, pushing a product. Um, but I don't, I don't see it quite that way. Uh, we, we quite often define brands in relation to products. And we think of a product as being something that sits on a shelf, maybe, or a service that exists on a phone, for example. Um, whereas a brand is something that exists in people's hearts and minds. So a brand is really the sum of the, is all about the associations you have of that particular thing. And uh, those associations will, will lead you to regard it favorably or unfavorably. So when you see a can of like Heinz tomato soup or, or Cadbury's chocolate, uh, there's all sorts of associations that that triggers, that those trigger, which have come from all sorts of places, not not just from advertising, but from possibly childhood memories and all sorts of things. And so I suppose in the context of something like the law, the question is, well, um, what, what are the associations that people have about about the law, about individuals, about, about firms, um, and how do you manage them? Um, and that those those memories and associations do very much go beyond they're not just about consumer brands they they apply to they apply to microsoft they apply to deloitte job talk about later and so on uh, and then communication is really uh to to sort of tell people that those brands or products or institutions are are there um i think it the great thing about communication is it builds familiarity um and we know from lots and lots of studies that familiarity builds trust. Uh, and it's just a simple truth that in business to business, particularly, but in many areas, uh, you're more likely to buy from, um, you're, you're more likely to trust something you're familiar with and you're usually more likely to buy something, something that you trust. And so it has a very simple role in a way of just, of just building up that, that um, familiarity. Although of course it also does more than that. And the way we think about communication is that everything a brand does is to some extent communicate. So when you step on a British Airways flight and you hear the Lackme music, um, which you've been hearing for years, but possibly, possibly too many years, but, um, but it still communicates and it, and it gives you an impression about BA and it triggers all sorts of memories about BA flights that you've taken in the past and, and so on. Or if you go to, if you see the green and yellow of a BP garage, or you go into Westfield and you see the sort of carefully constructed world of a, a Hollister store or something, not you can do that really much at the moment, but um, that's all communication. Uh, and then finally advertising, I think Miles has already defined that, but that's really a part of communication, which is particularly about paid media. Um, it used to be most of branded communication, now it's only a part because there's some, uh, there's owned media. So what you do with your own channels and there's earned media, which is what happens in social media and so on. And, and uh, things that you spread that take on a life of their own. And I suppose the benefit of advertising is that perhaps it's a bit more controllable than some of those other things. 
um, sorry, rather long answer. Thank, thank you, John. So and, and I guess that what we're talking about is, is initially raising profile and awareness of, of, of a brand or an organization or a service. And, and um, Helen, does, does profile matter to a chambers? I mean, how do you view it in, in your seat? Um, thank you. And first of all, good evening, everyone. Um, I mean, as you said in your introduction, life, I think, at the bar has moved on very considerably since the days pre-1990 when we were not allowed to advertise at all. Now, um, profile does, or at least should matter, in my view, to most chambers for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, clients. Clients uh, use websites uh, as often as the first port of call to find out about the barrister that's been recommended to them by uh, their professional client list lister. Um, so our professional client list lister. And they look and they, they will look people up and they will not only look at what um, we each individually have on our website pages indicating which tribunals we've appeared in, not indeed the first tier leasehold tribunal, uh, or what cases we've been in, but they will look more generally at the chambers as a whole. They will look at how the administration function is run, the support team. They will look at, particularly increasingly with American clients, they will look at what steps chambers are taking in the CSR sphere. They will look at policies in relation to equality and diversity. They will look generally at the place that the person working, that they are intending to instruct is working within to see uh, whether that is something that fits in with their approach to many of those matters in some cases uh, and, uh, and so on. So clients, it's very important. It's not just websites that clients look at. They also look at individual LinkedIn sites sometimes. Uh, and indeed, I've heard of clients who look at Twitter accounts. So we do all need to be a bit careful about expressing views on Twitter sometimes, not just because of what the Bar Council has told us to be careful about in relation to that. That's one category of person for whom profile for Chambers is important, uh, but they're not the only ones. Uh, chambers should um, be worrying about their profile, in my view, when it comes to attracting talent, so attracting pupils or lateral recruits. Uh, again, for most um, students, I would, uh, many of you who are on this call, the, the difference in information that's available to you um, as compared, for example, to when I came to the bar is huge. You have access to websites, LinkedIn, Twitter accounts to look up um, the chambers. And it's very important that we use those materials to convey as far as we can an image of what it is like within each chambers and how we might differ from some of the other places that you might be looking also to apply to. Uh, and the third group is staff actually also. This, it's again attracting talent within staff, but they will also look at what Chambers has on uh, its website as a way of getting information in relation to whether this is a place that they wish to work or not. And Chambers are small businesses essentially. And so most of us want to attract staff uh, who stay for a while. Uh, and so that's also important. So yes, profile does matter, but it's not just because that's a way that helps generating work. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And just to take on John's point about differentiation when he was describing marketing a little bit, uh, I, I, I looked at quite a few websites, including your own, it's an excellent website. And of course, you can, you can do some interesting exercises. You can map websites by, by dimensions, um, um, formal versus conversational, aspirational versus practical, technical versus accessible, prestigious versus normal. I would say yours came over to me as, as rather prestigious in, 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 in feeling. Um, and I, you may um, be able to tell me whether that's subjective or not, but that's how I felt about it. But the thing that I, I really noticed about yours was that uh, of all the websites I looked at, it had the best use of content. So actually the, the website is all about the delivery of content and, and, and there's very frequently updated content, um, which is, rather differentiating actually compared to um, a lot of the competitors that you have. Um, how do you organize that? I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, it must require quite an editorial function within in the chambers. Well, I, I'm delighted to hear that you think we've achieved that because we only just have achieved it, I would say. I mean, our website 
as most Chambers websites, uh, no doubt true, have been through a process of iteration. And the current version is only about a year old, I think. But we spent a lot of time, a lot of members of Chambers, realising how important it was, spent a lot of time looking at how we make... Yes, um, you're right. We probably were trying to indicate a degree of prestige, but also experience. You know, we want to be regarded certainly as the best advocates or some of the best advocates in our field and want that to be conveyed through our website. But uh, we want people not just to come to our website once to find out a CV for someone. We want it to be a source of information for professional clients and lay clients as well. Uh, and you're right, that required uh, a model to be set up so that we could make sure we were updating it regularly because our old EBS website wasn't. And so it became very stale too quickly. Uh, and we have processes in place and we have staff to help is the short answer. But, but it, it, um, it's useful for that reason, I think, also. So it, it does stand out. And I think uh, my observation is there's a lot of generic imagery. There's a, there are a lot of towerscapes and skylines um, that look as if they've come out of a stock book. There are some very generic strap lines, you know, a leading set of barristers chambers specialising in commercial and employment law as a, as a slogan. It's, it's not going to do John's job, really, of, of differentiating. So I'd like to now move back to John and talk about this idea of identity, of what does make you feel and look um, unique. Um, John, what role does identity play in, in profile building? Well, it's, um, yeah, it's fundamentally about, about recognition. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that, that suggests that um, in the marketing world, it's very valuable to have a degree of sort of distinctiveness um, that, that just being, yeah, just, just being remembered and, and building up sort of memory structures, they call it, is kind of quite, quite an important thing. So it, so it does that. Um, but identity also, also generates certain associations and, and there's, and it's, it's quite a subtle thing sometimes. Um, but often an identity or an aspect of an identity like a color or a or a logo or just a, a graphic or something is repeated so many times and you come across it so many times that it that it sort of accrues um and many things build it um and i thought to illustrate that i would just try try a little exercise um and i hope this works but it's kind of called um it's kind of called guess the brand um from some aspect of its aspect of its identity and obviously I, i'm not going to hear audience participation here so i'll just put each one up and and you can sort of say to yourselves uh, if you if you recognize the brand or not it's apologies that these are mostly consumer brands but there's a couple of sort of business to business ones that i've i've put in and um we'll see if you we'll see if you can if you recognize these um, Right, so can can you see um, can you see three stripes? Yes, yes. Okay. Adidas. Burberry, quite easy. Just a colour. Might take a little bit longer, but that one's Cadbury purple. Domino's, something we all probably wish we were. I've, we, we would normally be ordering more Domino's, but we've been staying a bit clear. Evian. Facebook. This is another F, and it's a B2B. So can you get it just from the colors? Don't know. Some people might, some not, but it's FedEx. Colors again, um, but there's also an animation style here which is kind of interesting. Um, and that's Google. Um, and they did a lot of work to um, develop a distinctive feel from the way, just the way the, the dots behave. I'm sure everybody's got one of these in their hands, Heineken. Or something really weird, like um, the little bottle tops on top of cozies that you put on top of innocent bottles. Another B2B one, slightly obscure, a bit old school, but that's Intel, Intel Inside. Another beverage, Jack Daniels, Krispy Kreme, Lego, 
that's just a partial um, if it's like but it's interesting how quickly you recognize that but you might get it just from the type um, and the sort of general style of it and the, the line so that's Nike sorry about my internet connection um, Oreo so that's kind of a graphic of the product I suppose slightly obscure one but that's Pixar Quality Street, Red Bull, Simpsons, Homer, Loves Donuts, animation, the style of the animation itself. Um, something very nice to get, a Tiffany box, just from the color really. Um, the experience, uh, obviously very like, I haven't been using this so much recently, but it's Uber. Uh, Virgin and so that's uh, Virgin Atlantic and so there's a lot of stuff in there like uniforms and a certain sort of confidence about everything. Windows. Sometimes it's a person again that defines a whole brand so if you know that that's X you probably say okay X Factor Simon Cowell. Just just an icon that you use all the time. Young people unfortunately because I've done some work with BBC but young people tend to use this a lot more than the BBC these days. Or a tagline, which is Zoopla. And so what's kind of interesting is that all these things contribute to an identity that it's built in so many different ways. Um, and this is, the, this, this is the sort of stuff that people in my company think about, just how can we build up, um, how can we use these things in intelligent ways um, to, to build up recognition to build up the right associations and ultimately to, to sort of build a, uh, a brand that people are, people are drawn to. Um, and then as a final little exercise, um, th this is really just a question of like, what, what can you do with a logo um, and what meaning um, and what, what associations can you generate just from a, a very, very simple logo? So if I ask you to think for a moment, like what does that, you know, what does that suggest to you? Um, and, and why is it working in, in that particular way? Um, and I would, I would uh, propose to you that it suggests quite a few things um, because it suggests motion, um, which is good for an athletic brand uh, because of the swoosh itself is sort of feels like it's moving, but there's also a forward lean on the lettering. Um, it's very, very powerful um, because the, the, the type's compressed. Um, it's in capitals. Uh, it's sans serif, so there's no sort of flowery bits. Um, and often in the early days of Nike, particularly, they used a lot of black and red. Um, it might, to some people, mean victory because Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. Um, and interestingly, probably in the old days, not many people really knew that. Um, but nowadays, um, as, as Helen was saying, because everything's so connected, and because everything's so available on the internet, the fact that the Nike name means victory, even though it's an obscure Greek goddess, can be very, very widely known by a lot of people in a second um, by searching, by searching on, on the internet. Um, and, and if you're at all interested in Nike, you can go to Wikipedia or whatever and you can find lots of things out. It's positive, it's a tick. Um, it's designed to be very visible. The swoosh, particularly without the Nike word, is very, very visible on shoe. So it's very visible when an athlete's winning a race on a track and it's pretty visible in store. It's not really like other ones, so it builds that distinctiveness. And finally, it's a bit aggressive and all, and all because it's a bit sort of pointy um, and that's part of the brand too. And so all of that just seems to be coming out of a very, very small thing. And this isn't to say that every chambers or, or every, um, you know, entity in, in the law should have to sort of, you know, think about all of this in such minute detail all the time, but it is just to show that the sort of detail matters in a way um, and it does build um, associations. So that was my little exercise about identity, which I will now unshare. Thank you for, for, for that, John. And, and so it, it could well be, therefore, that part of the more in, in our title might be to do a little bit more creatively, in, in, in truth, as, as we look at websites and other means of presentation. Um, but I'd like to extend it now uh, to a level above uh, um, uh, uh, and ask Helen, I suppose, the provocative question, which is how much of a brand you know, can a, can a uh, Chambers be? And, uh, and associate 
that a little bit with a question about culture, because br brands normally express the culture of a, of a, of a company. And, and we always used to say that a, a brand could be personified as an individual and you could say, um, this brand believes that XXXXX, Coke believes in optimism, et cetera, et cetera. Is it, is it pushing it too much to say that there are cultural threads or strands which define, for instance, um, a, a, um, a set of chambers, one from another? Helen? Um, I, I think the word I would normally use is ethos. I think different sets of chambers do have different uh, ethoses. Um, and that is in part because uh, they, they are all in individual collections of self-employed barristers who have been there for a long time. And so it becomes um, a very close sort of working environment, although we don't work with each other because we're all individual self-employed barristers, but we are a group who tend to be in a one single chambers for most of our working life. That, that's not always true, but it is true um, for many members of the bar. I mean, chambers definitely at one level are brands in the sense that uh, we all take a lot of effort in uh, assessing people who are applying to us uh, and just determining that they are um, appropriate people to join us because when um, members of chambers are out representing clients, uh, we want to be able to say to potential instructing solicitors, anyone at Brick Court is is of a standard, for example, that means that they would be able to do, it, to, to do the job that you're asking us to do uh, to a high level. Uh, and in that sense, I think we do have a form of brand within different chambers because we do regard that as, a, as a, almost as a stable, that that is where we're coming from. I think also, they're coming back to the word ethos, which I use, would prefer to use generally, uh, chambers do have different perspectives if you, um, and different approaches about some things. Uh, and so what one of the challenges of redesigning the website, which we've just been through, for example, is how we try and convey some of that individuality of a set of chambers to the three groups that I mentioned being the people who we are trying to um, uh, speak to, communicate with through our website. Um, uh, and particularly, for example, in relation to attracting talent, mm -hmm. trying to give a picture of the ethos or to use your word culture within a set of chambers, which I think does differ from place to place. Yeah, no, I think that and, and, and it creates this very interesting tension in a way between the collective and the individuals, doesn't it? Um, because you can, you can press on your website and get anyone's CV off it. So my next question then is, can, can individual barristers be brands? I mean, in, in, in the industry that John and I worked in, it was very clear that there are individual um, people brands and, and, and uh, Master Treasurer referred to, to one um, earlier um, in, in business generally. Uh, I, I think people build uh, brand images for themselves. Um, do, do, you, it, 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 do you think the concept of an individual star barrister as a brand <laughs> exists? Is it a dangerous thing in a chambers? Um, how do you balance the collective and the, and the individual parts? I, I would prefer to say that we all have individual profiles. Yeah. Uh, because we very much are individual um, self-employed practitioners under a chambers um, yeah. brand, to, to use that, that word. Uh, I don't think that any of us have any of the forms of association that John referred to or was, or was just is illustrated by his slideshow. Um, I mean, we, we, we have a chambers logo, obviously, all chambers do these days, and we have particular colored fonts that we spent a lot of time looking at but none of that defines anything to do with the individual. And the individual profile is defined by the cases that they've done, the experience that they've gained, the um, tribunals in which they've appeared in front of, the clients who've been prepared to instruct them. Um, and 
I, I find, find, I mean, we all, all Chambers websites these days, everyone will have the quotes from the legal directories, which are obviously an important part of marketing and communication. But um, because those are human comments on individuals, as opposed to any form of uh, individual identification that we put out to the market, I personally wouldn't describe it as a brand, but John may well disagree. Yeah. No. <laughs> Um, well, maybe, John, you could, at this point, talk a little bit more about whether branding, in your view, can apply to professional services organizations um, as opposed to... Yes, I, I, yeah, I can, I, can, I can certainly do that. I mean, I, um, I, I, and I, I mean, I totally agree with Helen that you wouldn't want to be some sort of... You wouldn't want to... I mean, it sounds a bit crass to turn people into, into brands, but at the same time... Um, I don't know exactly how the decision making process works in the in the legal profession, but I suspect that um, to some extent associations about people still still kind of carry some weight um, because i'm I'm sort of assuming that when um, when a solicitor is looking at somebody to, to do a particular case, they sometimes they have a choice um, and that in certainly in most markets, some of the choices that people make are are driven by associations as well as purely purely rational factors um, and in fact there's evidence that in in most in most markets the the emotional factors actually play a very big part not and that's not necessarily because they're wrong either because they're often sort of tapping into a system of decision making that's actually kind of quite quite swift but quite accurate um, and so I would say well one of the things that for example on LinkedIn I mean that's obviously very very important um, but are, what about the, the way people describe themselves on LinkedIn? Because you get that LinkedIn profile. And I mean, I didn't write my profile on LinkedIn for ages, but, but I kept being bugged by LinkedIn to write a profile. And then when I eventually started writing, I looked at some other people's profiles and they always said, you know, this person is like one of the business leaders of the century, you know, and they've always done like all these amazing things and well, there's no humility in them at all. And there's no wit in them. And you just think, my God, like if people were really like as boring and sort of jumped up as they sound on their LinkedIn profile, then, then life would be terrible. And you know that actually they're not like that. Um, so I tried to write mine a little bit differently. Um, but uh, it's interesting that quite often people just sort of revert to a, a format um, when in fact there's lots of scope to build associations through through something like that uh, but in in professional services um, I was uh, well I mean I could I w one of the things that um, that Miles and I actually talked about in the past when we were we were dealing with some um, some big Chinese companies was the was the the classic there's a classic uh, ad actually from McGraw Hill publishing, I think, which was a sort of B2B publisher, which just pointed out that if somebody came to sell you something and you, you didn't know them and you, um, they were trying to do a big deal with you, but you knew nothing about them, then you were very, very unlikely to, to buy from them. Um, and so I think in, in business to business, even though people don't necessarily want to um, operate in the, in the sort of shouty way that some brands operate, uh, it can still branding can still play a, a very important role um, and I've got a couple I mean I've got a couple of examples later on of um, sort of service brands if you like or brands that are not um, one's a, one's a business to business brand and the other's a sort of an organization but I don't know if we're quite ready for that yet Miles. Why don't you do that now? So I'll do that, I'll, I'll do that quickly now so, so these are um, right so just just a sort of example of um, uh, of what I mean. Um, so the first one is 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 Deloitte, um, which is a um, client that we've had. I didn't work on it personally. It's um, uh, but uh, I know a little bit about it. And and Deloitte's an interesting one because, you know, when I was um, leaving university, you know, accounting was or accountancy as it was called was was not you know it was not the most kind of necessarily glamorous profession and I wouldn't say that the accountancy firms had much of a an image 
um, or, a, or a sort of allure to them. It was quite a sensible decision if you did it. And Deloitte for many years was like, you know, one of the big four accountancy firms after they'd all done their mergers. Um, they had a consulting division and they brought it, uh, they sort of brought the whole company together really around this little symbol, the green dot, which was quite memorable at its time and very much established them as sort of one of the, you know, a good company within the big four. Uh, but then a few years ago, they came to um, uh, Super Union, one of the companies that's now Super Union, and, and said, well, actually, we've got a bigger ambition. Um, and we just, we want to be like, pretty much like the best professional services firm in the world. We don't want to be known for accounting or consultancy or any, any, any one of those things, but we just want to seem like we're a, a great firm. Um, and as a result, that, that single dot, um, the, the sort of design solution, if you like, was partly to, to use that dot in, in a much more sort of flexible and dynamic way. So the, the circle, which sort of forms the dot, was, was kept, but there are like myriad uses um, and hopefully the sense you got of Deloitte, Deloitte was um, uh, here's an organization that's dynamic, uh, that does many different things, that's interesting, um, that's, that's got a bit of style about it. Um, and I think what's interesting, and this is totally to echo what, what Helen said earlier on, is that in professional services and in business to business, brands are not just about, they're not just directly about selling stuff to clients. Um, they often work indirectly in that they, they help to motivate the employees. Um, they help to attract partners. Um, and, and crucially, they, they, attract, they attract talent. Uh, because when people are doing a job search, they tend to sort of make that mental shortlist again in, in an associative way. Um, and so that dot has also um, recently sort of manifest in, in sort of global advertising, um, quite, quite simple, um, but quite intriguing at the airport, um, often um, in installations at Davos that um, probably had to be there to really under, sort of experience it, but that are very, very striking. Uh, in a, a, an app that reduced, that actually helped you save time in meetings. And I kind of, I kind of like this, this quote actually, which I just found today, which is some, um, uh, someone at, at Delight said, "We're sorry, I'm getting a bit feedback. We're the first and last name in professional services, um, but having a name around a real person makes a difference, and that sounds like it's a good, you know, it sounds kind of quite like um, the situation that some chambers find themselves in in the law that." Yes, people are people and they're individuals, but also there's a there's an opportunity to have something around that um, so that you can feel a part of something. So that's Deloitte. And then the other one I just wanted to mention was BBC Two, um, just because uh, it's interesting in that it's an organisation. And again, for BBC Two, the, the branding of it or the identity of it plays a role that isn't just about sort of attracting people to the channel. Um, it there's also kind of subtle connotations of well actually BBC Two is an interesting thing and therefore in a way it's you know it's helping to sort of people feel people feel good about the license fee and so on um, but also it's also very much a talent brand so um, it's very important to BBC Two that content producers want to make stuff for BBC Two um, and want their and want their stuff to be want their shows to be shown on BBC two. And that just helps to improve the product quality going forward. So when we started working with BBC a few years ago, BBC two was much loved. It had this old identity, um, the fluffy two, which you can see. Um, and it was very, very loved, but it felt rather dated. And um, there was nothing kind of particularly much to sort of unite it. Um, and so what you will see on BBC two now is that um, there's a lot of different, there are lots and lots of different idents, uh, but they're united by this device called the, the two curve. Um, and the intention there is to, is partly to sort of, I mean, pr promote the diversity of the channel in a way and, and, and link the branding to the fact that there are different, um, there are different types of shows and experiences on BBC two, but also overall to make it feel uh, somewhat, somewhat kind of fresh and interesting and just that it's 
not a dusty channel, um, but that it's very much looking forward and breaking new ground in some of the shows it produces. And so you get some, um, uh, you, and you get quite a wide variety. So this ident might be suitable for something kind of like a, I don't know, a sort of geography, a travel program or something like that. Um, whereas this one would be more suitable for um, something fun um, and uh, uh, humor and so on. So, uh, and that's, that's really just to say, I think, I think, as I say, to sort of echoes, echo Helen's point earlier on that, that building a brand is, is not just about touting your wares directly to clients. That's often the very important part. Um, but it's also about uh, decision-making is quite a complex thing with many factors. And it's about building uh, every step, a little bit of preference towards your particular institution. So, so it's quite interesting because the inns of um, court are our professional membership bodies. And there's a very clear difference if you look at the way in which um, the inner temple is branded um, compared to, for instance, Gray's Inn, just to, to take, take one example. So the inner temple has obviously been through a rebranding exercise. So it's done the sort of the BBC two job that John's just described. We have the Pegasus reframed. And it comes over as a progressive brand somehow. Um, uh, it's, it's got clear colorways that are quite sober, um, dark blue. It's got a clear typographic identity. If you go to Gray's Inn, it's a, it's a mishmash of colors. Um, it's much more aggressive in your face. It's assertive. And the slogan, because there is a slogan which in itself is quite a um, edgy and kind of sometimes dangerous thing to have in this area, is make your mark. So it, it's sort of unbelievably sort mm. of ambition, defy, you know, seeking. And, and so it just feels, well, to use, your, to use the word ethos, it just feels like a completely different ethos. So is, is, that, <laughs> is that real brand differentiation, do you think, or is it just uh, accidental? Uh, is that for, for Helen or for me? Either, either, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, I hope it's real brand differentiation. We, um, as, as Guy mentioned, um, Master Treasurer mentioned, I sit on the uh, management committee of uh, Inner Temple as well, and we spent a lot of time um, at the management committee level. And also we had a special um, communications committee looking at it. Uh, and we spent a lot of time trying to get the right message about Inner Temple into the website. And I'm delighted actually to hear, as I'm sure Master Treasurer will be, to hear you describe it in that way because it appears that we have succeeded. Yeah, no, very much so. But, but, well, let me raise it another level then, because this, this seminar is about the social context of the law. And what about um, public confidence in the law as an aspect of social context? Um, so we all remember those dreadful headlines. Um, if you go to the Bar Council and look at whether it promotes itself as a brand, the answer is a convincing, resounding no. Um, there are three words, um, integrity, justice, excellence. That, that's it. No, they're not defined, um, they're not explained. Um, they look as if they've been randomly picked out of some, some lexicon. Um, so in a society which is increasingly questioning elites, which include um, elites like this, um, is is that enough, do you think? Or do you think there's a, a branding role as often happens in other industries where the, 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 the business itself has to be defined, explained, defended or promoted in some way? Um, I, I think this is a complex issue. Um, the Bar Council is a representative body. Uh, it is a representative body for barristers. Uh, and has a lot of initiatives that are supporting um, barristers and barristers chambers in developing their work and whether they need or don't need a brand I'm not sure because they are not uh, individually affecting clients um, talent uh, as such they, they are more representing um, people who want both to come into the profession in some ways but also those who are there chambers um, and indeed in a temple uh, we do have more of a 
general brand. But uh, we also have a, it's, it's difficult for any of those institutions to step into a, a political arena at all. Uh, and I think, speaking for myself, certainly looking at it from the Chamber's perspective, it's important to have regard to subliminal communication rather than direct communication in many of these fields that you're describing. So subliminally, one of the things that we want to try and get across through our website is that we are all individual you know, human beings and we are real people and hopefully nice people to work with. Um, but we're not going to have express statements on there because we're a group of 90 plus different individuals with different political beliefs and different approaches to things, expressing um, a corporate ethos in the same way, for example, as I've been following, I don't know if, if some of the audience have, but I've been following the Super Tea Twitter debate where you've got tea companies actually getting engaged in really direct comment on current affairs. Um, and that's just not going to happen, I think, at the bar, because ultimately we are collections of individuals who can't step into the political sphere. So we have to do it in a different way, which is just be very aware of the subliminal messages that we might be creating through material that we're putting, the communications that we're putting in, in well, out there into the ether. There is a very valid um, marketing strategy called an obliquity, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which is creating, creating uh, meeting objectives through oblique means. And, and in a sense, you were talking about CSR before, um, that, that seems to me to be particularly important. Um, what about, for instance, at the moment, Black Lives Matter? Does, how does that fit into the texture of a, of a brand in, in this area? Um, it does, and we put uh, relatively early a statement on our website, um, reaffirming our commitment to the quality of opportunity, uh, addressing the areas which we feel that we can address as a Chambers, which is the quality of opportunity, trying to increase um, access to the profession. Uh, the political issue, the broader political issue, um, we as a Chambers can't address. And so that, that is a, an area where, yes, of course, many of us have private views and some of us have expressed them on Twitter or uh, indeed on LinkedIn. But on, uh, through a Chambers website, it, it's, it's um, more difficult. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Helen. I think probably now is the time to ask for questions from a very patient audience. So um, I'm going to probably ask for help, um, but I may be able to see uh, participants who raise their hands. Um, would anyone like to raise their hands from the virtual audience? Deborah, please, Deborah, could you, can you, can you utter your question or? Hi. Um, Hello. I was listening and I was thinking that don't, wouldn't you say that there still needs to be some sort of discretion within um, chambers and law in general? Um, what I mean by that is that uh, I see the, I see a need for there to be a good communication between the clients, um, bringing them in, and not even only clients as well, but people that want to join that chamber. But I feel as though law is meant to be strict as well. So wouldn't you think that there would be some sort of discretion with information that is put out for everyone to see? I'm going to direct that to Helen, first of all. Um, we do have quite strict uh, um, guidelines, uh, in fact, on, on what goes onto our Chambers website, for example. Um, and because, in, I mean, in, in a way, there is a Chambers brand. I mean, it, we have regulatory obligations, so we are obliged by the... By, there are certain rules in the BSE handbook that apply in relation to anything that any barrister puts on a website or indeed uh, equally can apply to social media if a barrister is identifying themselves as such, so certainly on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, everything has to be truthful, uh, it has um, not to 
um, uh, potential, have the potential for bringing profession into disrepute, all those sorts of things, as one would expect. But we also um, have to have guidelines because we're a collection of 90 individuals. And just to take as an example, if we have got two um, members of chambers on opposite sides and someone wants to put out a press report about the result of the case, then that has to be worded carefully so that it's not simply someone saying, I had this fantastic victory, the other side you know, didn't see the arguments coming, so on and so forth. That couldn't happen. And that's why quite a lot of material on barristers' websites is informative, but um, without expressing much opinion. Uh, individually, however, in terms of our individual Twitter accounts or, or LinkedIn accounts, uh, people do have a bit more freedom. Okay, so thank you. Deborah, are you happy? Um, yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Uh, I've got, I can't see these. So, Paul, can you help me on the names? Uh, sorry, Kunal, Kunal Dua. Or failing that, Alistair, Alistair Adamson. Paul, can we um, admit either Kuno or Alistair? I, hello, I think both Kuno and, uh, in fact, Kuno is, is ready to go if you'd like to speak up. Yes, yes. Uh, so my question is for Master Davies. And so do, do chambers have uh, an advertising or marketing budget? Do they engage advertising and marketing agencies? And do they have a person dedicated or not looking after that particular function? Uh, the, the answer, certainly in the case of my chambers, to all three of those questions is yes. Uh, we have a marketing budget, and I expect most chambers now have some form of marketing budget. We did engage uh, agencies to help us redesign the website, uh, and we have full-time marketing employees in chambers. And I think that will be true of most large civil sets, certainly. Uh, whether all of those are true of all sets, I wouldn't know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then the next question. Kuno. Oh, Alistair, sorry. Sorry, hello. Um, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, my question is for Master Davies. Um, I was just wondering, um, I think most brands would probably agree that social media presents the biggest opportunity for their growth. Um, what do you think on the individual level, so for individual barristers, are some perhaps well-advised uses of social media and some uses of social media that may better uh, be avoided? Um, I think well-advised is using social media to um, enhance your profile if you can so for example it is now a way and and i should hold my hands up here if you look at my individual social media activity i'm actually a very late adopter but um it's a way of self-promotion in some ways so it's a way of publicizing um cases that you have um obtained a good result in it's a way of publicizing articles that you've written or books that you've written so putting material out there that is relevant to showing your developing experience and ability to take on cases. Um, it is also relevant, I think, in terms of any other activity you're undertaking. So, for example, I did actually tweet something about tonight. Um, so I'll retweet it in a temple tweet about tonight. So where you are, it's a way of um, increasing your profile in that way. The area to be dangerous that you should avoid and that is very dangerous is commenting either on um, well, on political matters. There are some the Bar Council, sorry, the BSB have got guidance about uh, the use of social media, which tells us all to be very careful about expressing political opinions uh, in via social media in in social media where you're identifiable as a barrister certainly, um, and you, you do need. To be careful about that and I just recommend that anyone just looks up the guidance before engaging in that field. 
Thank you, Helen. John, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, no, that's great. I mean, I, I would just say that um, probably LinkedIn is is the is a really important medium in the, in this area and you can you can target very precisely in the commercial practice you can target managing directors by by discipline um but um generally for, for me the thing about um using social media is not to use it in a pushing way but to use it in a yeah. pulling in other words to bring people in um uh, and, and when you're using linkedin that that, that usually means good content. So it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is not just having a bland blank CV, but having some really interesting material in it and having content that people want to want to read. So social media in itself is only a vehicle for promoting content in, in, in a sense. Um, right, that's who we've got next. We've got uh, um, Nika and then Joshua. Nika first. Hi, good evening, and thank you so much for the talk so far. I found it very interesting. I just had a question, a few questions, just in regards to Chambers. So staying on the subject of social media, um, I've noticed that some Chambers use social media a lot more than others. Um, so I wanted to know, do Chambers, when looking at pupillage applications or when considering um, pupils whether it be for simple work experience or you know for pupillage do they look at social media profiles and make decisions based on that and also why is it that not a lot of chambers use social media or why why is it that some chambers use social media more than others uh, i guess that's probably for me again um on the first question my chambers doesn't I, but there may, it may be that some chambers do. I, I, I don't know. And just in, this, in the same way that some employers do and some employers don't. Uh, on the second, I suspect it is just a question that comes back to ethos of different chambers and what the view is within chambers as to whether that is a good or bad means of communicating with um, the target audience that I, I described. I mean, we, we, as I explained earlier, do have a marketing manager, director, uh, and we do use social media um, as a chance um, to um, seek to get messages out to people. So, uh, but other chambers may not regard that as as valuable as, as we do. It probably also involves an issue of time, I think, as well. Um, so, uh, you know, to do social media properly, you, you need people who are prepared to commit the time to, to do it. And it get, then it gets into an issue of authenticity, which I think is a real problem in this, in this sector. So in a, a CEO of a large global company can just about afford to pay, pay for two people to do his, his social media, our social media. But it, 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 here, it, it, can't be, it can't be like that. It's got to be done by the people themselves. So at the end of the day, you run up against time as an issue, I think. Yeah, I would. I mean, if I just to so Helen doesn't have to answer all the social media questions, I would. I would say. Um, I mean, I think LinkedIn is a really is a really interesting one um, for uh, barristers because you know I sense that yeah you wouldn't want to. It's it's not very brash LinkedIn. You know, it's it's quite it's quite kind of restrained and it's not too breathless. Um, so there's a real opportunity, I think. To as Miles said, if you've got if you ever have written anything that might be of interest um then linkedin's a good place for that for that to sit um and and many many sort of personal personality driven brands in the um in the rest of the world are you know the content doesn't necessarily just have to be about um the the your own subject directly so if you take um Stella McCartney, for example, there's lots of there's lots of cut stuff comes from Stella McCartney that's not about selling clothes or about fashion directly. It's just it's just interesting and it gives you a sense that uh, that brand kind of cares about certain things. And obviously, you can't go near politics and and things, but there is probably an opportunity on LinkedIn to just convey a little bit of your personality and um, aptitudes, as long as you're kind of careful about about how you do it. Um, but it does seem it does seem quite sort of untapped territory often because I, I imagine that if you 
and most of the time if you look at business LinkedIn pages they're just they're just not very interesting and they're all very very similar thank you for thank that. you so Joshua next um, hello um, from my um, experience um, a lot of chambers seem they're advertising on their website seems quite passive advertising they put things on their websites for then potential clients both professional and lay to to review um, with the introduction of, as you say, manage their marketing teams within chambers, do you think we'll ever get to a stage where chambers and maybe even individual barristers have more active um, advertising and putting themselves out there for um, lay and professional clients? Helen? <laughs> uh, well, we may do. So one of um, the large commercial sets, not my own, uh, last year, put a lot of videos on their website of uh, individual members talking about the different practice areas. Uh, we, we personally didn't think that was the right way to go. We didn't like it that much, but they are very fond of it. So I think it all comes down to, again, the individual view of different chambers as, and individuals as to how they want to do it. I don't think you will ever see barristers' chambers running TV ads or ads on the sides of buses or anything like that. It's, it's all just a question of how proactive, I suppose, the website is. And we are all increasingly using uh, websites, LinkedIn, to market seminars that we're doing, putting videos up of those seminars. We're, we're coming a bit, a bit um, more progressive in that sense, not just in informational, re direct informational reports. Um, but that's in part because the technology has just got a lot better, so it's, it's easier for us to do so. And, and Joshua, I can add in one more slightly cynical comment, which is when I first came back to Oxford, um, I looked at the colleges' websites, all the colleges, and thought, why do they all look the same? Um, and the answer was that, that only, only two agencies had worked on them. <laughs> so, so the same people were designing um, these websites. They may have been designing them for different clients. Um, but but there wasn't much breadth. And in my brief research in this area for, for barristers' chains, I noticed that there are two or three agencies that specialise in them. So, so part of it is going to a small group of vendors who have produced the same old, same old, same old. And, and I suspect one answer to our question, our exam question today, is you could, one could do more just by opening up the creativity a little bit to a, to a wider variety of vendors. Yeah, I, I would I would just say that maybe um, I mean I kind of think probably it's a it's a little bit like restaurants if you if you're thinking of like a if a if it's a prestigious restaurant it was like advertising at you the whole time you'd probably be a bit like nervous about that but it doesn't but the restaurant still um, conveys things about itself that that kind of make make you want to go there so um, a certain amount of it's about the style of the communication but but to come back to an earlier question. I suppose one of the arguments for doing a bit of marketing is that um, it makes the profession and the individual chambers and so on look more, just look a little bit more welcoming. And, and that um, because marketing in a way is a sort of invitation to get to know you. Um, and so that might help a little bit with the distance that perhaps some people might feel from, you know, from the profession in that I imagine sometimes it looks a little bit um, you know, it, it might look a little bit, if you don't know it well, it might look a little bit difficult to get into and sort of quaint in some of its um, practices and so on. And, and in a way, marketing, if it's done well, can just sort of express a bit of openness and invitation, which I think could be a, a good thing. And now, uh, there's been a very patient hand raised by Master Nice. And I shall now call Master Nice to ask a, a question, then move on to Deborah. Thanks. It, it might help... Um people, particularly the students, to have some idea of what went before change, why change came, not in order to undo change, but to just be quite sure that change was a good thing. The well-meaning dinosaur in the age of no advertisement would probably have said that without advertisement, it was possible to make the entire bar available through the medium of solicitors and through not insider knowledge, but through private knowledge and conversation, it's possible to make the entire bar available to somebody so that she or he 
could get the best advocate at, at the best price for her or his problem and dilemma. Now, that, I, I'm not sure that that would have been the arguments that were raised, and no doubt arguments were raised in opposition, but those, that's probably roughly what it was. And I wonder if Helen and possibly other, even Master Treasurer, and I'm not sure if Master Sheeman's with us, would like to comment on whether the change has um, left us in that idealized position or not. Master Treasurer, why don't you? Um, Jeffrey, th that, that could well set the cat among the pigeons. Um, let, let, I've got a few thoughts on that, and I was thinking about them as this very interesting symposium has been unfolding. Um, I bet there are loads of barristers at the bar who all long for the days when we just weren't allowed to do any of this because life was an awful lot simpler. We didn't all have to spend lots of money on um, marketing consultants and on designing websites and all the rest of it. Um, we were slightly ahead of the curve in chambers before the rules were, were relaxed and we had a thousand copies of a brochure printed, which was wholly anodyne. This is way back in the late 80s or very early 90s. It just said, um, in chambers we have the following people and we do the following stuff and here's our telephone number. And the bar council, which was then the regulator, not, not now the representative body it is, uh, got wind of this and it ordered us to pulp the whole lot. And we did, uh, apart from one copy that I, I filched away to put in the chamber scrapbook. And, and those, I thought those were the easy times. The truth is, I think, well, this is a personal view, that none of us really has any idea whether any of that, this really does us any good I mean, what we um, think, the, the way we think that we show how good we are is by going into court or by advising people and our name gets put about, put about because we're good and not because we put statements on our website saying how great we are. We, we do use social media a lot. We tweet about our cases. We put those on LinkedIn. But again, I think the thing that really has purchase with us is just doing a good job. And I was wondering about the parallel with medicine. I mean, I wouldn't choose a doctor for an operation because he's got a great website. Um, and I wonder whether that isn't also the case for the bar. So as far as I'm concerned, the jury is out with marketing. And I'm terribly sorry if that sounds blunt for, for you, Miles, and you, John. But it's the way I think quite a lot of us feel. No, I, I agree with you, you're a doctor, but I'm not sure about a private hospital. <laughs> um, I'm going to take one, one more question from Deborah. So, um, yeah, I was actually going to ask what Master Nice um, was speaking on. Um, but the next question I had is that um, speaking on social media, how detrimental can it be to a barrister? if they were to um, say the wrong thing on online? Um, the, I mean, it obviously totally depends on what you say, but there have been disciplinary proceedings brought by the Bar Council uh, in relation, sorry, the BSB, sorry, not the Bar Council, BSB in relation to certain things that have been said by some members of the profession. So, we, we are ultimately we are a regulated profession and we need to comply with the regulation and if you manage to say something that doesn't comply with the regulation then the BSB will normally hear of it. Okay then, thank you. Thank you. I, I do see Sabika, so Sabika would you like to ask your question? Hi, um, my question is to John Shaw. Do you think, in your opinion, the bar is unnecessarily conservative when it comes to marketing itself? And, or, and do you think it needs to go a little further? How much further? And, or would you think that it would sort of take away from... John, did you hear John, that? I didn't hear the end of it. 
Did, maybe that's my band, uh, but uh, I got the bit about does the does the bar seem unnecessarily conservative or over conservative in its in its marketing, and um, I suppose that would uh, relate a little bit to to Master Treasurer's comment. And I think my, um, I mean, I, and Sabiko, if I've missed some, then please come come back in. But I mean, I think first of all, I would say I haven't done like a full like audit of all the bars marketing, but I suppose to um, the, the, the argument for being a little bit more out there, I suppose, is there's a saying in advertising that nothing, nothing kills um, a bad product faster than good advertising. Um, and that would slightly be my response to Master Treasure in that I think marketing and advertising and communication, what, what, that all, what it does is it shines a light on um, something, on anything. So if, if, and, and that's a good thing because it, 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 it brings, it brings the good things to, to the top as a rule. Um, and so that would be my one argument, I suppose, for it. And then I think the other argument partly is to say that, um, as we talked about earlier, it's, it's not always just about selling directly to clients. It's, um, because I would say if you don't, if you didn't do any marketing and you didn't have a website and you didn't have a brochure and you just completely the chambers were just completely anonymous. How would you, how would you sort of, how, how, how would that help talent coming into the bar? How would, how would that help them on their journey? Because I think to me, their journey is somewhat assisted if they can get to know a place a little bit. Um, and it probably helps to match the right people up to the right chambers slightly. Um, and therefore a little bit of marketing can be quite helpful in that. Um, as to Sabika's actual question about is it is it too conservative, um, I would I would just say I don't know because I haven't audited it. But um, it is interesting that, for example, in the case of Deloitte, uh, I think a lot of people, without knowing it intimately, but a lot of people were very very worried about um, certain aspects of the marketing and you know sort of this professional services firm suddenly kind of getting quite. Um, ener doing quite energetic marketing um, but that kind of evaporated when their business doubled um, and you know people were I think apocryphally pe people were actually quite nervous even about having the green dot on their business card because they thought it looked a bit silly um, but it's funny how quickly you get used to things um, and um, as I say I think if it's if the alternative the alternative of no marketing just feels very sort of sort of obscure and secret society these days, um, but I would, I would not advocate super brash marketing either. It seems to me to be done in a very appropriate tone. Thank you, John. Well, on that note, uh, I, I should probably wrap up. I, I, I do have a duty which I was bidden to perform because I think this session forms part of a qualification. Is that right, Master Treasurer? And we, we have to tick a number of boxes. So I just want to record that we have talked about ethics and, and, and Helen has um, uh, defined some of the ethical um, barriers in, in relation to communication. We've talked about advocacy and, and, and maybe it's helpful just to see advocacy, advocacy through a different lens and uh, how brands advocate their strengths. Um, uh, uh, we've talked about uh, equality and diversity and inclusion a bit as being part of a brand. Um, I really do believe they have to be baked into a brand and not just an add-on. And I hope that this expansion of the notion of social context into image perceptions um, and how you reach people um, uh, has provided um, a different perspective, perhaps, of its social context. So with that, maybe it's duty done. And uh, I would just like to thank you very much, um, Master Treasurer, for for hosting this and uh, particularly would like to thank our panelists, um, John and Helen. And the awful thing about Zooms is you can't clap people properly, but anyway, a metaphorical clap and thank you very much. And, and Miles, for, for my part, can, can I thank you, the speakers, for entertaining us so, so much this evening. Um, um, Miles, you, you speak with boundless experience and expertise in this area and, and you handled all the questioning, I, I thought brilliantly. Um, you also introduced the word obliquity to me, which I'm, I'm very <laughs> grateful for, and I have to see how I can use it. Um, John, you um, you made me think, and this will keep me chortling from a good for a good while yet. That Gray's Inn was the Nike of the of the um, the Inns of Court, 
um, that uh, there will be rich pickings from that to come, I'm sure. Um, in, in a temple, uh, I also feel, feel very proud of, in the light of what you've been saying, because yes, I think it's got a very nice, fresh image, and we did spend uh, an age on that. And Helen, you've made me feel, feel good about my chambers, because most of the things your brilliant set does, I think we do too, and it was endlessly reassuring to hear that. Anyway, up. Uh, all of you, and Jeffrey, thank you for your participation. It's been wonderful to be part of this. All those of you who have attended, there are 144 online at the moment, we're very grateful to you. Without you, we'd be speaking into a void, and it's been, it's been good fun. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.